Hi, you're listening to the She Speaks We Hear podcast. This is a platform for British Muslim women to talk about the issues that matter to them. Muslim women have been identified as a hard to reach section of society. Our aim on this podcast is to get our voices heard. Hi, and welcome to episode nine of the She Speaks We Hear podcast. I'm Shamin Zia-Din, editor-in-chief of She Speaks We Hear and this podcast's host and producer. I'm really excited for the guest today as I've been following her on Twitter for a while since she appeared on a documentary called Make Bradford British. If you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. It's very entertaining. She is Sabia Pervez. She's a communities reporter at BBC Look North in Yorkshire. For the past seven years, she has worked tirelessly with communities across the region, building relationships and ensuring groups that often feel marginalised by the media are engaged. She's worked on some of the biggest stories in the region, from grooming to radicalisation to last year's racism and cricket scandal. She's also worked extensively throughout the pandemic on stories regarding digital poverty, cost of living and mental health. Sabia is a trusted reporter in Yorkshire with a strong reputation of telling stories that matter. She's also a very proud Bradfordian and a proper Yorkshire lass, not to mention her most important job being a mother to three children. Asalaamu Alaikum Sabia and welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you for having me genuinely and I am very well. Thank you very much. Well you mentioned that you're on your last day off so really appreciate you giving us this time because I know what it's like um, with kids and you know every minute is so precious when they're not around and when they're around obviously it's a, a different ball game altogether so what I want to know really is how you got into journalism and how you got to the place where you are today a reporter for uh, BBC North. Look North yeah um, so I have always been very gobby from a very young age so I grew up in a very deprived area of Bradford actually the postcode that I grew up in is one of still the, the one of the most deprived areas in the whole of the UK. Um, and my parents had a corner shop, just like very, you know, a lot of uh, Asian immigrant parents who came here. My dad had a corner shop. And I think actually I learned the fundamentals of journalism in that corner shop. I grew up there. I think we stayed in that area till I was about 10 years old. I would constantly go there and spend time with my parents. And I think there I learned those key skills of empathy, uh, communication that I didn't realize were so valuable until I entered journalism. Um, And I think those early kind of formative years in that area really cemented my interest in people. I have always loved people. I love stories and I am a proper extrovert. Like I get my energy of people. Um, if I'm not around a crowd, you know, for a number of days, I feel my energy starts to dip. But as soon as I'm out on a story and I'm meeting people who are doing interesting stuff, I, I find that my energy just spikes again. I'm buzzing. So with journalism, like I said, I, I've always been really gobby. I've always had an interest in people, in news, in current affairs. Um, and I did uh, philosophy and politics at university with the view to always going into politics. You know, I wanted to kind of be a radical change maker in a place like Bradford because I saw that not many women entered politics, um, but also I was raised by phenomenal women. You know, many of them probably didn't work, but they were phenomenal change makers in their own right. And that really defined the person that I am today. So I wanted to kind of project that and, and influence, use my own influence in, in the way that I could. I started studying uh, philosophy and politics. I'd studied politics for seven years prior to this. And actually, when I started studying at uni, I realised actually politics is not something that I want to go into. Um, I feel like the pursuit of power can corrupt you if you're not careful. So um, what I realised is that I actually just want to talk to people. That's what I'm interested in. So whilst I was doing my final year um, in my degree, I was I was also volunteering at the Bradford Community Broadcasting Station, which is a voluntary radio station. And there, Channel 4 approached me to take part in this documentary. Um, and I, at the time, interestingly, was doing a dissertation on how Muslim w- women uh, are portrayed in the media. So right. I was wearing the hijab. I was wearing the hijab at the time. And I said to them, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing this. And then I did. And after that, I think after I went on that program, it just catapulted 
and I found myself in journalism and I absolutely love it. I haven't looked back since. I remember watching that documentary and I think that's when where I first saw you and I had started following you a few years after when I realised you were on Twitter. And it was nice to see an opinionated uh, Muslim hijabi on there. Um, I think people don't always realise what journalism is actually about until you're in that industry. I mean, storytelling and communicating is basically the crux of it. Um, and it's it's nice that you found a career path that suits your personality because I've I've like I've I've studied journalism, so you meet people who are quite shy, and it takes a long time to come out of your shell. I mean, I'm not super confident myself not super loud I can be but it is hard if you, if you already have that in you if you're already extroverted I think that probably helped you a lot because you really have to go up to strangers and start talking to them and it's, it's hard it's not easy for a lot of people so I mean that came naturally to you I guess oh yeah yeah and I come from a massive family extended family system I've grown up in the community I have six the six sisters six of us and we're all very loud. My uncles are all very loud. If you come to a family gathering, you're having to shout over each other to be heard. Um, I come from a very bubbly, very opinionated family, very loud, and a family that have been kind of change makers. In you know, every single person is doing their own thing. I come from a military background, so both my grandparents uh, were high-ranking soldiers in the Pakistani army. So it's I come from a family where you know, being loud and proud is just who we are. It's in our blood. So talking to people, I'm not shy of it. I, honest to God, buzz off it. That's my passion. Um, I love people. And I actually, like, um, my team know this, so I can say it, but we laugh because, like, they know that when I'm in the office, I'm just going to complain. I like being on the road. I like being on the streets. A lot of people tend to shy away from, like you say, you know, a lot of people tend to shy away from that and don't want to do it. Whereas I'm, I'm just like, throw me out there. You know, um, I, I thrive off it. So to any young people listening who have that kind of personality, you would recommend journalism for them. So that might not be the first thing they think of when they think of career paths. Yeah, I, I think it's not just about being kind of personable and, well, I wouldn't say opinionated, but it's, it's not just about being personable and, and loud and uh, being an extrovert. It's also being curious. So, you know, like I said, I was always... When I say gobby, what I mean is that I was always very nosy. I, When I was even from a very young girl, you know, young age, sorry, if you speak to my parents, they'll tell you, I'd always ask why. Why do I have to do this? Why is it different? You know, I want an answer. I want you to rational, help me rationalize this. So I think if you have that natural curiosity, that natural nosiness, if you want to dig deeper, if you want to know more, if you're fascinated by things that are different or you know cultures that are different or practices that are different and if you're not judgmental I think I think this is the fundamental thing growing up in Bradford um and, and in the area that I grew up in there were so many different communities living in this area it literally was a melting pot and I think for me what it was is that I I didn't have any judgment I my parents always brought people in they were busy you know they were developing their business so I never had judgment of people I was just always really fascinated and you need to have that fascination um and that openness really openness to not only kind of disrupt other people's uh kind of minds but to disrupt your own when you're a journalist you're going on a journey and you're taking other people on a journey with you as well yeah, I mean, having an open mind is really important. I mean, I'm very naturally nosy, which is why I love journalism. But yeah, being non judgmental is 100% important because actually, what happens, and you've probably found this, you might have an assumption about something and then you do the story and it's completely different to what you think it might be and what they're going to say. And then that throws your whole story and then you have to change it. So that happens a lot. Um, I'm sure you would agree. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I always tell people that I did a story in Leeds a couple of years ago, so pre-pandemic, um, and we have a red light zone in in in, in Leeds, so it's where uh, sex workers can work freely. I, mean, I don't know the, the, the kind of classification on that now. I don't, know, I don't know where it stands, the status of that now, but at, the, at that time, it was legal, so that particular area in Leeds was a, a sex zone, a red mm -hmm. light district, basically, a red light area where you could sex workers could work without yep. being criminalised. And I had to do a story from that area. Now, I'd never um, worked with sex workers before. And naturally, you have your own, you know, you, you, we have kind of, 
condition conditional mindsets you know we have our own preconceived judgments on that and when I did that story and I spent the night so I had a kind of a, a bodyguard and a cameraman with me and I spent the night out on the streets with these women and it was amazing and it wasn't just amazing because you know, I, I love stuff. I love doing stuff for stories like that because it's hearing from the real people. It's getting to the real kind of belly of the story. But also it really jolted my mindset. It made me rethink. It took me on this journey of actually, why did I think like that? You know, um, and having those conversations for, for me with those women was just really liberating. It, it helped me understand them and it helped me to empathize. And I think For journalism, you know, you asked about kind of advice that I'd give to people. The golden skill, and it is a skill because I've got children and it's not innate, um, is is empathy. If you have empathy and if you can nurture that, then you'll go far. Well, that's a good point you raise because empathy in children, um, when you're raising children, either they have it or they don't innately, as you said, then you have to train them. I find that really hard. I don't know if you've had any success with that. How do you nurture that in a child is completely kind of off topic but just while we're on the topic of uh, empathy. Oh, I think it's just well we've done it most of my, my husband and I have done it from a very young well since the kids were babies well since they could talk to so toddlers and it's just the idea of well how would you feel you know how would you feel if if so and so if I said that to you if, if so and so treated you like this and I remember distinctly we did that we did it with our eldest uh, and I remember this clearly is that when she started nursery there was a young a little girl who was who was there at the time as well and she'd every day every morning bless this child she'd always cry you know because nursery is a traumatic thing for kids and I remember we'd stand Danny apart and we'd say to Danny when we've left we want you to go and let's ask her you know how are you don't cry it's okay I'm here you know don't worry about it in two hours your parents are going to pick you up and Danny would do this you know every morning and I mean now Danny's 12 uh, well she's going to be 12 and it's one thing that her you know people around her will say that she's got that in her so I don't believe it's innate you know I believe that you really have to plant that seed in your child you have to say to them, how would you, how would you feel like it? You know, how would you feel if this was you? Um, and allow them to step into that person's shoes. And I think the younger you do it, the more it's a habit, the, the easier it is that it's formed. Yeah, I'd say that's uh, good advice. So tell us um, a day in the life of Sabia, like as a reporter, I know no day is the same, but how does your kind of day go as a mother, okay, so- as a reporter? Okay, so I'll tell you, my day starts at six o'clock because I have three children, right? Um, so I tend to wake up and I, um, uh, I I need to pray. For me, prayer is really, really important. And if I don't pray in the morning, if I don't do my Fajr prayer, I just feel like my whole day is going to be rubbish. Um, and, and faith for me has been central. In my, I've been through a lot in my life. Like I've been through a hell of a lot. And faith is the one thing that's remain my constant you know um so I start with my prayer and then I have my breakfast I watch the news so by about seven o'clock I wake the kids up my husband and I then share it out we get them ready get them to school and then I have the morning meeting at 9 30 we have a a news meeting at 9 30 which sets the agenda so at that point we will discuss as a team what's going on what are the stories on the day? Where do we need to be? It's just a discussion discussion board about what people think we should be doing, but these are the main stories. And at that point, I'll be told, okay, I, I need you to do this. Will you put some calls in here? Or will you go check out what's going on? Now, sometimes I have a pre-planned day where I plan that, okay, somebody's, for example, somebody's organizing a vigil or somebody's doing something in the community or if there's an event going on, I need to go and film that. So I'll go away do some research, film it. Sometimes I have to edit it all on the same day. So we've got to shoot, um, edit and broadcast on the same day. And if we do that, it's manic. So from nine till seven, you're just flat out. Sometimes you don't have time to break for lunch. It's just crazy. And other days it's more relaxed. So literally, yeah, no, no two days are the same. But it's in it's yeah, it's a it's in an insane amount of pressure. It's very fast paced. But that suits me because I have a kind of personality where I get bored very quickly and I love working to time deadlines. So if I didn't have a time deadline, I would be very lazy. So, yeah, it, it suits you, me you really well. You thrive under pressure and you like the oh, kind yeah. of fast-paced environment. I, I love it. 
I love it. No other job would fit me. I just get, I'd get bored. It's so you know? nice to hear um, somebody who loves their job that much because we live in a world where a lot of people hate their jobs. So it's really refreshing to hear how passionate you are about that. Um, so you've done loads of really interesting stories, controversial stories, like you covered Rotherham, um, grooming gangs, uh, racism scandal in Yorkshire. What has been one of the hardest stories you've covered as a journalist? Oh, wow. oh God. Oh, goodness. Okay, God, there's been so many. Um, The hardest. Or challenging, something that you, or you didn't want to do, but you had to do. I, You know, it's interesting. People always ask me this question, and I always struggle to answer it. And the reason why is because, right, there's always challenging stories. You mentioned Rotherham. So I came into the BBC in 2014 when the Rotherham headlines were just dominating. It, it, I literally came in as it was all kicking off. And um, I came in as a rookie. You know, I wasn't even a journalist at the time. I'd come in as an intern. But I saw that there was the certain things that we weren't doing properly or, you know, we were missing. So I went straight in and gave my perspective. And the team were brilliant. They took it on and they said, OK, if you can help us get access, we will fly with this. And we did. Um, now, they were challenging because, you know, these are communities that are already feel under attack. You know, for example, in Rotherham, the Muslim community there already uh, was feeling kind of uh, under pressure or, or under the limelight because of um, there's a lot of Islamophobia going on and they just feel isolated, right? And then all this happened and they felt even more under scrutiny and people didn't really want to talk about it. Um, and I think the key, the challenge there was to empower people. The challenge was to go into those communities and say, look, I don't want to tell your story for you. I'm giving you now the chance and the opportunity to tell me what's been going on here. I want you to take ownership of this narrative. And I think the challenge, what was challenging about that was that I was going into those communities for the first time. And those communities, not just the Muslim communities in Rotherham, I think now I've, I've been doing this job for seven years now. It's, this is not just uh, specifically about Muslim communities. This is about any minority community and even kind of white working class communities, communities that have, you know, previously been disengaged, you know, they've been marginalized, they've been forgotten, will have a severe distrust with the media. So you have to build relationships. And that was a challenge when I first came into the BBC because we hadn't invested time. And that wasn't the fault of the BBC. It's just that they didn't have the resources. So I think for me, that was a challenge is that we had really big stories and we had to tell them and we had to be authentic, but we had to do that uh, with people who are well-placed to talk on, on, on behalf of these communities. And I think we did, we did a good job and I did a good job. Well, that okay. sounds really great. Um, difficult topics, as you said, but now you've been working um, in Bradford, you live at, you're from there, as you said, you've created those and developed those um, relationships now you probably know about everything that's going on in Bradford so now you're at a place where you know if you need something you know where to go and it probably saves a lot of time and effort because you've put the investment oh, yeah. in time wise yeah absolutely and my my method of journalism is that I don't want to be chasing my tail I, I, I don't want to be doing that you know and, and often you know we can't help that because it's breaking news and we're, we're very reactive so you are sometimes chasing your tail but what I like to do is put blocks in place so that if anything breaks I know who to go to instantly you know so we're, we've got well-placed sources we've got authentic voices um but it is you know it's it's a lot more comfortable for me now and not just in Bradford I've worked the whole of Yorkshire I've got contacts in Batley, Dewsbury, Sheffield, Fuddersfield, everywhere and not just ethnic minority communities you know across white working class communities as well now and I think for me like you know I did a story um in was it Dewsbury Batley where uh, a young lad um it was a really sad story a young lad had um blown himself up in in Iraq and he this is a couple of years ago now this is when all the you know the young people were joining ISIS mm -hmm. and um I, through some contacts that I knew who knew his family, managed to get access and managed to speak to his parents. And it was really, really heartbreaking because wow. they'd lost his son. So you get to see two different perspectives, right? To the world, he's a suicide bomber and he's a terrorist and he's killed all these people. But to that family, he's still their child. And, and in those situations, you see these worlds collide. And it's a really kind of interesting 
perspective, you know, being there as a journalist and, and weighing up these two sides. So, um, yeah, I think that definitely, um, Alhamdulillah, you know, I've, I've got those contacts. I've built really strong relationships. But also I think it's that I have this, and I talk about this often, is this burden of responsibility that I carry. Honest to God, I do, like, you know, you feel it when people put their trust in you, when they give you their time, when they're sh sharing you know, their lives with you. You have to do them right. Um, and I think that's the kind of... I talk about being a Bradfordian and, and being raised in the community. That Those are values that I was raised with. That If somebody gives you something, if they invest in you, don't let them down. Um, they give you their word, don't go back on it. You know, So those are kind of principles that I've taken into journalism. And, and I guess that's what's helped me build my reputation. You mentioned Islamophobia and you know, lots of white working class communities um, who also feel aggrieved over the years through austerity or whatever. Um, have you found it difficult to speak to certain communities who do have, you know, have some racist views or have Islamophobic views or just haven't spoken to Muslims? Have you ever experienced sort of negativity towards yourself? No. So I, I mean, I, I get, odd, I get the comments, you know, so when I did Make Bradford British, right, um, that Tunnel 4 documentary that I did a couple of years ago, well, I say a couple, I think it's been about 10 years now, um, <laughs> time flies so fast, but yeah, my daughter was one, so yeah, definitely been about 10 years, I got a torrent, a torrent of abuse, you know, then, both um, kind of Islamophobic, but also from within the Muslim community, right, uh, and I think this is something that I want to draw out, is that for me it's not just about people attacking me because I'm a Muslim and they don't like me because I'm a Muslim or whatever it is I find that if you don't fit what people expect of you right whether they're brown or white or whatever color they are if you don't fit a preconceived conception or, or a kind of preconceived expectation of what people have of you they're gonna hate on you right and they're gonna send you criticism or they're gonna feel like they need to say something I just see it as I'm here, if, if you have a, a stereotype or if you feel like I should behave in a certain way or you expect me to uh, um, behave in a certain way, that's on you, that's not on me. You know, I'm going to keep being the bright, bubbly person, very, you know, very curious. I'm still going to come to you and ask you questions about how you live or what's going on. And that's not going to stop me. You've got to deal with your own issues. And, and that's not to say that I'm not glossing over the fact that I've had, you know, racial discrimination or anything like that. But for me, it's about keeping that positive mindset and to go into it thinking, well, there's no wrong with me. You know, I, I have, a, I'm a very cultured individual. I'm very well read. I'm educated and I'm very open. I'm very open. And everything else that you throw at me, that's on you. And that's for you to deal with. I'm here to do my job and that's it. Well, I'm glad that you haven't experienced anything uh, too bad and you've been able to, to have that attitude to kind of combat any sort of negativity. Let's talk about the BBC. So recently BBC has come under fire for a few years now about impartiality and also um, was it a couple of years ago or last year when they told all the presenters to not state their opinions on social media. How have you found that experience working for the BBC? I think actually, and I know a lot of people have a bit of uh, qualms with this and everything else, but I think for me and the work that I do, it actually helps. It helps a lot because what what it does is that it allows you to take the middle ground. Well, let me give you an example. I think the best way to illustrate this is by giving you an example, right? So with the Yorkshire with the Yorkshire County cricket scandal um, that just happened recently, I think it was November back end of last year. Um, yeah. That was a really difficult story to tell because it was, you know, you know what happened. There's a lot of race or alleged racism, and then some of the racism they kind of admitted to, and everybody was talking about it. It was very triggering for a lot of people. Now, in that instance, it could have been easy for me to turn around as, you know, somebody of Pakistani heritage, Bradfordian, Muslim woman to turn around and, you know, give my views and give my opinions. And what I thought in that instant was actually people expect me to do a job here, right? 
And my job was to gather the, the kind of the uh, reactions from the people on the people on the street. And I think this is what where I kind of rationalize it and, and try to make sense of it is that I'm a journalist. I'm a professional. You don't need to know about my opinions. My job isn't to tell you my opinions. My job is to tell you the stories of other people. Not, not actually, no. Not to tell you the stories of other people. Allow them to tell their stories. Hand over the mic, right? And I think if I started giving my opinions and my views on the world, it clouds that judgment. And and I think fundamentally, when the BBC says, you know, you're meant to be impartial and don't tell your opinions on, on social media or whatever, what they're trying to do is protect protect the journalism because if you know what I'm thinking you're going to think that my piece is biased you're not going to be listening to everybody else that I'm wanting you to hear from and I think that's the, that's the crucial thing it's about protecting the journalist and allowing us to actually tell the stories that matter it's not about us it's never about the journalist it's about the people that we're trying to tell the stories about that's true that's true I think a lot of people might find that they're kind of silenced other other journalists or other um, presenters. You don't even have to be a journalist. I think you just, I can see why people would struggle, but I guess you make a good point and uh, it makes your journalism more authentic and more reliable because um, we don't know what you're thinking yeah, and I think, about I, a certain I issue. I think everybody's different, right? So it's like you were saying, asking me about kind of racial discrimination and how I feel about Islamophobia. Obviously, Islamophobia is horrendous and I've experienced it and it's horrific and it's so dehumanizing. And I also am aware of my privilege as well. So I think it's it's very my perspective is very different to what any you know what other people's perspective will be. Everybody's experiences are different and you respond in your own way. But I think my thinking has been um through a lot of reflection, you know, when you talk about Islamophobia, when you talk about your own opinions and, and how you behave, I just root it back to in a professional sphere. That's exactly what I am. I'm a professional and I know what's expected of me. And, and I know that in this instance, for me to do my job and the job that I do with communities in, an, in a place like Yorkshire, it is crucial. It is absolutely fundamental that my opinions are mine and they're kept in a private space because people expect a certain standard from me, not just my bosses, but the people that I'm, the audience that I'm serving. And if I'm not doing that, I'm feeling at my job. Fair enough. Going back to uh, people who want to get into journalism, what uh, would you advise them? What do you think is a good path to get into if they've just, say, graduated from uni um, and they haven't done journalism or they're just a young person? H- what did you do and what would you advise for someone who's saying aspiring BBC journalist. So I would say I did a lot of volunteering. Like I said, I volunteered at the local Bradford radio station. I did. I was, before I even got into journalism, I was writing a lot. I had a blog and that was picked up. I And, and actually through that blog that I had, um, the Guardian approached me and the Independent and I started writing for them. I was doing freelancing. And then obviously after Make Bradford British, um, that just kind of catapulted me and then everybody wanted me on panel shows. The BBC wanted me on panel shows. So I think is that, you know, if you really want to, if journalism is something that you want to go into, uh, kind of hone into your niche, what is it that you're passionate about? You know, what particular stories matter to you and really kind of make sure that you're um, bringing that out and, and develop a brand for yourself. You know, so for example, what I think is, you know, when I'm doing my journalism, I want people to see my name and see my face and think, oh, yeah, we know what kind of stories, you know, they, they, they get that kind of stylized. They know what they're going to get from me. It has my own stamp on it. So what's your stamp? You know, because everybody wants to be a journalist, right? We've got so many people who want to be journalists. But what makes you different? And I think, you know, it's interesting because when I was growing up, um, so I English isn't my first language. You know, I grew up in a Punjabi household. Punjabi and Urdu were the languages that we spoke. Um, and it's interesting because, as you know, as a young teen growing up in, in, in a city like Bradford, um, in, in a place like Yorkshire, I was very, I wouldn't say ashamed, but it wasn't something that I boasted about. It wasn't something that I said with my chest, oh, I speak Punjabi at home, I speak Urdu at home. Um, 
But, you know, as I've grown older and had my own kids and now that I'm in journalism and, and I've actually when I started uh, reporting at the BBC and I was going into these places like Rotherham and Dewsbury and Batley, I was getting stories that nobody else was getting. And it's because of my language skills, you know, it's because of the fact that I have a big extended family and I knew how to network and I knew how to speak to people and knew people wanted me to be straight up with them. I had all those skills. And suddenly I was walking with swagger. You know, so it's these, you know, these little, little things that we see as, oh, it's just normal for us. No, it's not. Being able to speak three, four different languages isn't normal for people. You know, people can, some people only speak English and that's it. So if you've got those kind of skills, really hone into them and shout about it, you know, um, and it's something now that I'm, I'm very, very proud of. And yeah. Yeah, I think you won't be alone there. I think our generation um, who grew up in this country, like we were, I would say a lot of us were embarrassed mm. to speak our home language in public. Um, and I find that really interesting, actually, because I was the same. I didn't want to, I didn't want my mom to speak to me in Urdu in front of my friends. I don't know why I felt embarrassed. Um, but now um, and actually, all the since then, you know, other mothers who are from anywhere in Europe, they have no qualms about speaking French or Polish or whatever language to their children. And it's sad that it was it's our communities who feel this embarrassment. And there's no reason to do that, really. And and you're right, as you grow older, and I realized what an asset a language is. And I'm trying to teach my kids our language which is really hard um but it's it's a real skill to be had and it's a shame we didn't appreciate it no absolutely but I also think you know and I keep going back to this empathy is crucial uh, is so crucial and I think you know and I say this to my colleagues a lot and anybody who listen is that you know when you speak to somebody in their mother tongue you know so if you go to these places and they don't speak English and you start speaking to them in their mother tongue you will notice the body language changes like that you know because suddenly you understand you can have a community you can you can communicate with them and you can't underestimate the power of that so yeah I would say anybody listening who wants to be a journalist find out what your stamp is what's your brand what is it that you're passionate about and what skills do you have that are unique to you um I read on uh, Twitter recently I can't remember who posted it but somebody said you know there's lots of Muslims and Asians in medicine and science but there's not enough in the arts what what do you think about I mean should we be encouraging our kids to go down different paths I mean I think I mean I definitely would um, but what do you think about that do we need more Muslims in yeah arts? I mean I, I completely agree with you it's interesting you see because when I was growing up um we had I was in direct contact with Sarah Joseph who I think was the founder of ML the Muslim Lifestyle Magazine. Yeah, um, yeah. And that was because I was affiliated with the Islamic Society of Britain. And that was brilliant in itself because it had a huge, vast network of Muslim professionals. Um, so I I experienced, you know, and I, and I was in contact with Muslims who were in the arts. Um, and I, I guess that helped me. Um, but absolutely, if you don't see it, you can't be, you know, we say that all the time. If you can't see it, you can't, you can't be it. And I think more and more Muslims are, you know, through, we see it on Instagram, we see it on TikTok. We are phenomenal creators. We've got so much talent, so much talent. It's unbelievable. We've got comedians, you know, everything is, it's there. And I think this next generation, the Gen Z are really, they don't care. You know, I was saying this to my dad. I was saying, you know, I've got younger sisters and I was like, dad, some of the stuff that these Gen Zers are doing, you know, it's brilliant, but I would not have had the guts to do it. Um, but they just don't care. And that's brilliant. You know, they, they're seeing their talents and they're running with it. Um, so definitely, I think we need more. And I think the reason we need more as well is that arts, it, the arts are amazing in the sense that it helps you communicate. It helps you uh, paint a different picture. You know, science and everything else is brilliant, right? It's brilliant. But I think the arts is just different because you're capturing hearts and you're capturing minds in a way that you can't do with anything else. You know, it's about culture, isn't it? Culture is phenomenal. Like, for example, TikTok, um, creating a two minute video can capture somebody's attention and can change their mind or plant a seed in their mind or dis dis kind of erupt somebody's thinking more than anything else can. So, yeah, I would encourage anybody who is interested in the arts to go into it. It's a powerful medium. OK, Sabia, I've got to tell you something. I've never been to Bradford. What? 
And I feel really embarrassed given that I've lived here all my life. You need in, to come. Uh, Lon- around Honestly, London. Bradford <laughs> is the place. And when, fingers crossed, when we win the City of Culture bid, then it's going to be even more popping. So, yes, I can't believe it. Like, you have to. Okay, if I come, are you going to show yes, me around? Yes, we have breakfast at Sweet Centre. We've got some amazing places to eat and places to see as well, actually. Our theatre places are like popping at the moment as well. So, yeah, you need to come. No, no, I will. And one other thing I want to ask you, next to your name, I think on, uh, is it one one social media channel? I can't remember which one, whether it's Twitter or Instagram. You've got your name spelt phonetically. Oh, wow. Tell me the different variations of your name. And I hope I've said Sabia Yeah, it's Sabia. Yeah, so um, people call me Sabia. And that really, okay. and that really <laughs> grates on me. I don't know why, but it's not Sabia. Yeah, so... I've had Sophia, I've had Sophia, I don't know where the F comes from, I've had Sobia, um, and I've had Sabir, so Sabir, like, you know, like Sabir, I've had that as well. Um, which is, like a boy's which name. Is a boy's name, which is ridiculous, but um, Sabia is a is a common one, and I, I don't blame people because it's, if you look at it phonetically, it's, it's spelt like that, but um, my name is Sabia, and um, so now I have put that down on my social uh, media platforms just because my channel's just because um, I just think you know you should be able to pronounce somebody's name properly just give me a little bit of respect you know it just takes you a second to read that and now when you meet me I expect you to say my name properly and it's okay if you know see it's okay if people mispronounce you the first time but what um is quite I wouldn't yeah, irritating, I would say, or actually quite disheartening is when people when you've corrected people and then but they still want to call you that name they've called. I've had that a couple of times. Um, but um, and I just keep saying, no, no, it's Sabia. And it's interesting, actually, because my son is called Yahya. And um, oh, yeah. gosh, that that must be difficult. Yeah, so he's called Yahya. Right. And then we've got a, an apostrophe after the H in his name. And when I named him Yahya, everybody said to me, nobody's going to be able to pronounce his name. They're going to call him Yahya. So when he was about six, I told him about his name and the history of his name. And I said, your name is Yahya. And people have to pronounce it the way I'm pronouncing it. And that boy, bless him now, wherever he goes, if somebody calls him Yahya, he corrects them. And I think it's really important because that's your name. You know, and if, if somebody isn't saying it properly, that's not right. So, yeah. I mean, I really like the name Yahya for my son, um, but it, I was vetoed because it's too difficult for everybody to say. So I'm so pleased that you managed to name him that because it's a beautiful Thank name. Thank you. But I'm very stubborn, you see. And everybody was saying that to me and I was saying, no, nope, you're going to say it properly. I'm going to name it and I'm, you're going to say it right. And, it, and they do. Thank you, Sevilla. It's been really nice talking to you. I'll let you get on with your day off. Uh, have a fantastic day. Thank you for having Thank me. This has been on. great. Thank you so much. You take care as well. That was Sabia Perviz. You can follow her on Twitter. I'll put the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Please rate and review as it'll help others find our podcast. And do follow us on your podcast app, which will update you with the latest episode. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just search She Speaks We Here. See you next time. 